18 minutes past nine. Tommy Zari, join me in the studio. We're going to talk uh, some Gaelic football now. Jarlett Burns, uh, I don't know if you've paid much heed to this this week. He was on with Joel during the week and uh, obviously was outlining his um, pitch to be the new president of the GA, which will be decided at Congress, uh, the first day of Congress this evening. He was up against four others, uh, but he was in with Joel, uh, running to be the next, uh, the, the president-elect, as uh, Tom was correctly wording it a bit earlier on. Uh, he has some somewhat radical proposal I would suggest in relation to the preparation of inter-county teams. He talks about uh, up to the end of the league, inter-county teams can only train on Wednesdays and Fridays. He says that uh, Niall Moyna um, has been telling him that inter-county players are doing 40% too much training. Uh, he would also introduce the idea that county teams can't train until January the 1st. And then he says that teams who break ranks are going to have 10% of their 250 grand GEA funding removed. So. Uh, whether you view those as radical or not, there are the proposals of Charles Burns as he runs uh, for the GA presidency this evening. Uh, one interesting response caught our eye uh, this week it was from the Meath footballer Shane McEntee. He says, I'm really not convinced about this common narrative around reduced training time. Many inter county players love the organised, uh, detailed setups that allow them uh, to develop at elite levels. Restricting this may lead to players looking elsewhere for elite level training and lifestyle. Shane, good morning to you. Morning, how are you getting on? You're uh, dead against it. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I, uh, I saw that and it, it caught my eye. And not just from what Charles Burns is saying, but I think, you know, over the last while, there, there has been a bit of a, a common narrative where you, you get really negative connotations towards the way inter county teams train these days with the level of detail, the level of preparation. Um, and, you know, I hear a lot of non players talking about it in a, in a way that we're nearly sort of prisoners to these advancements in training techniques and. Uh, equipment and the likes of your GPS trackers, nutritionists, all this, as if it's some sort of evil upon the game that that is uh, restricting players and the amount of time we put in. And I just felt, you know, I'm not trying to speak for, for every player here because there's clearly going to be different opinions, but I know personally, and I know another, a lot of other lads really enjoy this. They really love this this side of the game. And um, I, I don't see I don't see the need or I don't see the appeal. I don't, I don't see why such drastic action should even be ran or, or considered. Yeah, I'd say the rationale for ultimately from Jarlett Burns' point of view is that obviously we are seeing increasingly the players are having to retire early. There's obviously a lot of um, major injuries that are happening to players now given the lengths that they're going to obviously in terms of fitness that we may not have been mm -hmm. in a position for before. So the foundation obviously, obviously is coming from, interestingly enough, because it's probably the same foundation as your own uh, in retaining players to the game. Yeah, and look, I can understand that, and I, I'll have to admit, I'm I'm coming from a position where you know I'm not married with kids, and I've I've quite a I've quite a supportive structure around me in terms of family, girlfriend, employers that make it quite uh, quite conducive to playing intercounty football. And I understand there's a lot of people who don't have the same uh, the same circumstances in place. So as I say, I'm I'm only speaking for me and from other people. But I mean, in terms of training time and the injury load, you look at you look at a lot of other serious serious uh, people runners uh, cyclists that aren't necessarily competing at a professional level at an international level but you take like a good competitive club runner they're probably training 11 I was chatting to a friend of mine about this yesterday he's training 11 or 12 hours on his feet a week before physio before gym work before conditioning rehab whatever else you take a cyclist who's a good club not, not an international level cyclist he's getting 15 16 hours on the bike in a week so in terms of training load, you know, I think while we do train hard and we do make commitments, I don't think we're on our own in that case. I think, you know, there are uh, there are other sides to this as well. Shane, good morning, Tommy here. Um there's a number of there's a number of pressure points, uh, obviously in the GA at the minute, and we're not gonna fix them in this room or on a Skype call. But I'm just wondering what was it that caught your eye about Jarrett Burns' proposals? Um for me, he speaks uh, some sense. There's probably some some bits of it. Perhaps the two days a week uh, is just unsustainable. But one of the one of the major things that one of the major factors, I suppose, has been uh, reducing inter county spending and also the calendar problem. And I'm just wondering what you think about um, restricting training to January. If we could get the the season to work around it, I know pre season is important, but if training could be restricted to an eight month period or the inter county season could be restricted to a certain period. Would would that appeal to you? Yeah, like, uh, as well. I, I want to say I did see, agree with some of his points. You know, you make good points about the about the college competitions and the struggles they're having at the moment, and I think they're a brilliant competition. But 
I just think these these mass uh, nearly overreactions. I would thought like you you cancel train in November and December. Who's that benefiting? Is that benefiting the clubs? Do clubs want to play in November and December, and you get your inter county players back then? Um, you know, if I'm not training in November and December, um, what what am I doing? Like, um, and I don't see why this has to be enforced. I don't. I can't think about any other sport where this gets enforced. That no, you're actually not allowed to train there. You know, lads are voluntary going through it, and I do understand that we have we have fixtures issues and we're trying to revamp the calendar. But um, you know, I, I really don't envy whoever has to try and sort that out at the same time because we look at so many of these competitions across a number of different codes, a lot across a number of different age groups, and I find it very difficult to see uh, to see a working a working solution, which is difficult. But given the current the current structures we have, I, I just don't see why you take away November December from lads who, as I said, enjoy this high level uh, elite training. Uh, you know, looking at extreme examples, you're trying to. We've talked a lot about how we try and keep our best players from going to Aussie rules. Um, obviously, the clear lure there is professionalism and the or money earned and whatever else. Yeah. But if you're trying to appeal to lads on the other level, say no, we can give you this, we can give you that, and he's a highly driven, highly motivated athlete. We look at Connor Nash and Keen McBride in uh, in Mead, and you try telling them to stay at home, and they're not going to be training for a couple of months a year. Is that a is that can that be a part of a chain that you talked about the sort of professionalism? It's almost heresy to suggest it in some quarters, but that sort of pay for play thing would obviously take a lot of this out because you know you 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 have mentioned there already. Obviously, there are players in different situations to you with families or you know massive work commitments where it gets increasingly difficult, I suppose, to have that commitment. Uh, some shape of a pay for play would at least take some of that out of it. Yeah, I don't know. It's never something that's really that's really motivated me. I've never really given it a whole lot of time. To be perfectly honest, as I said, my situation could change, and and my current scenario means means I don't really feel I'd I'd, I'd need it. But you know, I think that's kind of the sport we signed up for. I think that's what uh, that's what we really you know we're doing this because we're passionate about it. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see a pay for play thing coming into it. Um, but that's again, that's just my personal opinion. I don't want to speak for for every gated player on that. Shane, the phrase that Paul Flynn will use a lot is sustainable amateurism. Um, and I suppose the GA is constantly struggling to find the, the balance between, you know, the professional demands that everyone else is striving for and the standards that you guys are trying to set and are striving towards, sorry, and then the amateurism of the game as well and, and the core values of the game. Um, just, just going back to what you were saying about uh, your own personal situation, but also, I suppose, the phase of development that Mead Football is in at the minute. You guys are playing Division 1 football for the first time in 10 years. I could tell from speaking to Donald Keoghan on the show earlier in the week, he, like he's a man who is working in medicine and, and in in uh, pharmaceutical biology. I'm not sure if I phrased it right there. But obviously, a lot of uh, time commitments outside of football. Mm. He said he's never once questioned his commitment to Gaelic football or inter-county football. But I just want to flip that. So Mead are in this really exciting phase where you've got a really young team, you've got consistency with Andy McIntyre as manager, you're moving towards Division 1, you can see progress. That's Mead. They're, they're perhaps always in around the top 10 in the, over the last couple of years. We're seeing a lot of players this year, um, and I'm not sure whether it's more than other years, it feels like it is, stepping away from the game. Lads in their mid-20s, um, you would have played football in UCD, and I'm sure you would have played a lot of these guys as well, but... I keep bringing, going back to the names of Killian Clark and Darren McVitie and Michael Quinlevin and um, players in Russ Common, middle tier counties, you might say, who are stepping away from the game because of the demands. Perhaps these are players who have had uh, a lot of intense underage years as well. Calvin winning a lot of um, a lot of things on those underage mm -hmm. things, minor and under twenty one. So they've probably had a decade in the game already. Um, for players like that. And I know from speaking, I know this is a long question, but I'm from speaking to players who are perhaps with smaller counties and they have new managers coming in every year. They're going on trial in November. They're essentially going as hard as they can go from November. And again, with the structures, they might get no benefit out of it when it comes to the following June or July. They're not going to get to the Super 8s the way Mead are. For the counties like that, and I know it's difficult to step away from your own environment, but for the counties outside of the top 10, would you not see the benefit for reducing perhaps training time or trying to put a, a cap on it? Because as I said at the very start, we're trying to achieve sustainable amateurism here. Yeah, look, I understand that that's going to be an issue for people, but I'd also say that that's kind of the nature of sport as well. You look at most sports around around the world, there's going to be certain teams and certain people that, that dominate and, and you're going to have highly competitive, highly driven people that unfortunately through whatever circumstances maybe can't get to that level. But yeah, no, I'd, I'd admit that is difficult. 
But I, I do think the GA is coming around a bit more that lads are, there's not that same stigma with lads stepping away. Like we, we've had fellas in the last couple of years, Mickey Newman's one that comes comes to mind. He's took a, took a year out, got himself sorted, relaxed for a little bit, came back in and was flying. So I think, I think the GA is becoming a bit more fluid like that, that it's not as, it's not as rigid. I, I still don't know if reducing the training times going to do that. I, I, I really just don't know. Maybe, mm. maybe it would in some cases, but again, I, I can't, it's, it's difficult to speak for, for people from the counties you mentioned and as well for individual motivators. Like, you know, I, I just look at it myself. I like the routine. I like the, I like being able to test myself. I like being able to say, you know, we, we, we sat down a group of us last year and spoke about the amount of services that we, and I'd imagine most inter-county teams get, you get your nutritionist, your s and your psychologist, your medical team, all these sort of things that if I was, you know, an aspiring club uh, player or aspiring club athlete from another sport, that would cost me a fair bit of money to, to avail of those services, you know, and by having these well-ran and long, long-ran years, we get access to this. So even on a personal level, just in terms of motivating yourself through your own athletic development, that's one of the real pros and real pluses that comes with having these sort of setups. So, I, I just don't answer your question. I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to know what it would what it would be like if we went that route. Personally, I'd be afraid of the alternative because you could have some fellows on the cusp of maybe a League of Ireland team or an AIL mm. rugby team where they might get those setups. And if you're taking a good chunk of that year away from them, they might start saying, uh, "This is certainly not me because I wouldn't be next or near any of those teams." But you do have lads in in those scenarios that are making decisions, and then you start losing them, and then we're losing some more of our best of our, our best possible athletes. So. I don't know. That, they're, they're, that's my main thought on it. But I can see. I can see. There's another side. But yeah, I completely accept that. And, it, and it, it's hard. It's very hard to get a, a fine balance on this. Yeah, it's interesting that you are both kind of coming from the same point of view in terms of uh, trying to that sustainable thing and trying to keep players within the mm-hmm. game. Just finally, on a Jenny, you um, of the view that it's not these proposals, but something else is acceptable, or are you just saying it should be unregulated, unfettered access to whatever preparation needs to be done? No, no, I wouldn't say unregulated because, I mean, we still have a, a club game that's very important here. Um, you know, and I, I think there does need to be some sort of structures, but it was more just what, what caught my tail up yesterday a bit was I see so many uh, analysts and, and pundits, uh, you know, constantly harping this, this negative drum about about the amount of training, the amount of commitment, the amount of restrictions we have. And I just thought this was this was kind of feeding into that. And and I know there was other players with that, with that opinion of me. And I, I kind of... I bit the butter a bit and, and voice it. So, um, yeah, I do feel things are important to, to keep a balance for lads and to make sure they don't get, uh, at the end of the day, we're not getting paid and we're not looking, I, personally, I'm not looking to get to get paid. So, um, you know, we have to keep some sort of balance that a professional career is possible. Mm. But uh, I just think these extreme, extreme measures are, are completely over the top. Shane, moving away from that, um, you're one of a number of me players who have been injured this year going into Division 1. Um Mm. What's that been like missing missing Division One so far this year? I know you're on the way back. How's it been the last couple of weeks? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. It's probably the first sort of long term long term injury I've, I've had to deal with. And um, you know, you're looking at at these games and there's massive effort going in from the lads, and it's really really fine margins that you're falling short of. And I suppose naturally your mind starts to think, geez, if we had a couple more of our or maybe more experienced players available, what sort of a difference it would make? But I have to say, I've got I've got massive heart out of out of going and watching the lads play. Like even you were down in Killarney at the weekend, and after ten or fifteen minutes, you're thinking this could be a, this could be a really tough day at the office, and we really weren't that far away from from taking things something out of the game. So while you don't want to be celebrating a loss, and uh, we're not slapping you on the back saying it's all good, there was definitely there was definitely uh, great stuff to be taken from it. Shane, thanks, million. No problem at all. Cheers, Thank you. Shane. Thanks, Shane. Thanks, Shane. Cheers. Good luck. Bye bye. Proposals.